to, to frame Donizetti uh, in our recollection. Donizetti was an Italian composer who uh, lived uh, basically at the turn of the 19th century. He was born in 1797 and died in 1845, 1848. So um, it's uh, in, in the earlier part of the operatic style, we're talking about post-Mozart because he's born right around the time Mozart dies in 1791. And so he's had, Mozart's now had the great successes with Le Nozze di Figaro, and uh, that's the marriage of Figaro, and Don Giovanni, and the magic flute, etc., etc. Uh, so young Gaetano Donizetti comes on the scene. Uh, he's from a musical family and, and is uh, one of, I like, think, seven children big family, and he's a choir boy, shows a lot of talent, and about the age of seven or eight, is sent off to music school to study counterpoint and fugue. Now, one of the things about Donizetti many people may not realize, because I, how many of you have heard eight Donizetti opera? Any Donizetti? Two. So how many operas should name? We should have some time. Right, so we have a more Right. Um, Tudor Queen, uh, how many operas do you think Donizetti wrote? That's trivia question number one. Make a, a guess. What do you think would be a, a, a lot of operas? 20? 10? Uh, Higher. Keep going. How many operas do you think he wrote? It's more than 20. More than 30. More than 50. Donizetti actually wrote 75 operas, of which about eight. I'd say are somewhat in the repertoire. Elixir of Love, Bill uh, Pasquale. So to put this in perspective, he started writing operas pretty early. And they were shorter, one act, comic, uh, operas featuring a few, a few people. And what had happened is there's a transition in opera from Mozart's style, which, would, which I would consider sort of a set type. There's an aria and recitative, an aria recitative, and sometimes it's a duet. And then there's a finale, and he's taking this structure. And it's the style of singing, though, during his lifetime is changing to bel canto, which is what we're going to get into. Because there's a big difference between a Mozart aria and the arias that you'll be hearing today, which are highly ornamented and elaborate. Uh, and the music becomes very much the vehicle to show off the possible pyrotechnics of the voice. And so it required a slightly different kind of singer, too, that had a lot more vocal flexibility to be able to move around in the voice and up and down the coloratura very fast. Now, there's styles in the 1640s and 50s in Venice, the Montevero, the operas, and that was sort of how opera began. That was the public opera. Now you had a court opera too. And the courts, of course, they did much more elaborate production. Um, uh, in the public operas, they were offered troops that, that traveled around and did versions of the opera, whoever was available locally. If they came to Philly, they might come with you know, three major singers, and the conductor would come, and then they would pick up singers and musicians locally, and they'd do a version. That really happened until you began to see a standardization of the repertoire around 1750. You know, and just like movies today, you not only had the opera itself that was a hit, but you had growing up this population of really famous singers who were like today's movie stars. They were, they were tabloids. First time in history that you had tabloids published was really in relation to opera. An opera singer, sort of in the 1810, the 1810, 1810. So the singers who sang some of the roles we're going to see today, people who sang those kind of roles, they were got, you know, they were newspapers you could buy. Sometimes they told the truth because all the ladies carried them on and a lot of the guys carried them on. Sometimes they lied. And, and the, these are huge big, I mean, they are the movie stars. So they were absolutely, they, they, you know, they had the Robert Redfords, they were, you know, they had following. So oh, they, and I think when you, even when you deal with Lady Gaga, Robert Redford, forget it, he's old. But even when you deal with, with uh, uh, when you deal with Lady Gaga and and what's the name Patterson, huge star in the world, uh, that, that's really what they were. They were incredible.
incredibly, we can't really understand opera singers being as famous as these men and women were. And they were tremendously influential, and their goodwill was very important for the composer, which is one of the reasons that I was talking about the pulpit canto. It's one of the reasons you have such an elaborate vocal style in many of these operas, because the singers wanted that. So naturally, you play ball. If you wanted to get your opera on, you wrote to show off what a particular singer. Now, Donizetti, Rossini, uh, Bellini, the young Verdi, who was part of this movement, they didn't expect us to be doing their operas 200 years later. They were writing for right then. So, uh, for example, one of the most famous Athenas was named Giuseppina Strepponi, a tremendously successful, huge star, had innumerable illegitimate children. Uh, it was always reported in, in the papers. Shortened her career, and of course, they're in the papers all over Paris, because Paris was a big market. There was Italy, and there was Paris, there was also Vienna, with, and Donizetti was famous in all those places. He actually ran the Vienna Opera, which was also very popular in Paris, but he was a significant figure in Vienna. But um, Strepponi was uh, tremendous, so she was gossiped about it. Well, she was a very famous Adina. Adina is our hero, heroine today. She was so successful as Adina when it was done at La Scala in 1840 something, 1840, that uh, it was done. It was done that they did, they added performances, they did something like 40 performances because she was a big hot mama success. And there was this young guy named Joe Green, Giuseppe Verdi, who had just, who had had a modest success with an opera called Oberto, and he'd gotten, he somehow wrangled, I think the pony wrangled him, they, they were having a flame. Yeah, they were having a flame problem, problem, we don't know for that, but they probably were, because he was grabbing, and so was she. So anyway, so anyway, uh, uh, he got a commission to write an opera based on the King Nabucodonosor, except we call it Nabucco. And he wrote the part about Mikaela for Strepponi. Now, today, no one would cast an Adina. You'll hear our lovely young singer who does Adina. She has an Adina voice. It's a very pretty, high voice, and she can go high, and she can do a lot of rock. Well, Mikaela in Nabucco by Verdi is this monster part, it's this huge role, and it needs, it needs an, an immense range, a lot of power, she does a fair amount of screaming. You can't believe that they used to bark, but that's how it was. Strapponi wanted to be in the buco. She, she had a Joe, I'm sure, said to her after a night of bliss, you know, honey, uh, I'm actually gonna write for the lower octave. So it probably hurt your voice. Oh, go ahead, Joe, she said. So uh, that's how it, so, but that, but she was so popular, it didn't matter how she sounded, God only knows. It really didn't matter. People were really thrilled. And Nabucco became an enormous success. But, the, but the, yeah, that made Verity's reputation. But this, um, this emphasis on singers was a big part of what Andrew began to talk about, this bel canto, which means beautiful singing. So uh, this <coughs> style of singing is very melodic. It needs a lot of rapid use of the voice, which we call coloratura. You know, and coloratura specific things like trill, your two notes are alternated very, very quickly, and runs. That's a very contour style. Now, all of this is not, it's not there merely as decoration, although the singers did a lot of decorating. That means, and that's why you have something called the convenzione, convenzione which means that often it seems here in this way the guy comes out, the woman comes out, sings a recitative, and sets up. That's the chant like thing they say, you know. Solo ben cor, solo sono gente, and then he's got an aria. Now the first verse, the first time he sings the aria, he sings it more or less as written. But the second time, the idea was the singer would do an elaborate series of variations, and we have about some of that in our performance. Susan, of our singers, decorate, and that that was a big part of the style.